Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and it's Friday, so it's time for Gross Path Challenge number 42. As we get closer to the annual certifying examination of the American College of Veterinary Pathologists, the panic is starting to show in the eyes of the candidates, so I thought I would give you another multiple choice gross exam like you will encounter when you go to Tampa this year. Before we start, I want to thank all my friends and colleagues who have given me these fantastic images over the years, which allow me to put these quizzes together. And with that, get out your pen and your piece of paper. I'm going to give you a question. I will give you four potential answers. And then we'll go over the correct answer, the incorrect answers. And hopefully for all these questions, I have a recent reference for you. Slide number one is tissue from a dog. Cilia-associated bacteria were identified on H&E staining from this lesion. What is the most likely cause? A is Bordetella bronchoseptica. B is Mycoplasma cyanotis. C is Philobacterium rodentium. Or D, Proteus mirabilis. Once again, question is cilia associated bacteria were identified on an H and E stain from this lesion. What is the most likely cause? Think about that. I'll be right back. Okay. The correct answer is A, Bordetella bronchoseptica. This is from a 2016 JVDI article from Taha Abdelaziz at all, called ciliary associated bacteria in fatal Bordetella bronchoseptica pneumonia of dogs and cats. And I've been able to reproduce this in cases that we get. Now, you don't see lots of them, but if you look very closely, you can often find the bacteria mixed with the cilia on a good H&E stain with careful searching. Okay, your other uh, uh, your other possibilities, Mycoplasma cyanotis, possibility number B. Well, that certainly is cilia associated. Mycoplasma cyanotis is the mycoplasma of dogs. Mycoplasma live among the cilia uh, in the airways. However, they are cell wall deficient. You won't see them on any stain because there's no cell wall to pick them up. Uh, C, you might not have heard this particular name, Philobacterium rodentium. That's the new name after 35 years. Carbacillus has finally gotten its binomial name, and it's Philobacterium rodentium. You can see it in animal species outside of rodents, and it also is one that you can see, but you generally need a good silver stain to pick that up. And then finally, Proteus mirabilis. I don't know what that does in the lungs of dogs. I just threw that in there uh, as a foil. I know that it causes a number of problems in laboratory animals, especially causing urinary tract infections in mice and rats. Okay, you ready to move on? Let's go on to slide number two. Slide number two is tissue from a horse. What is the most likely cause of this lesion? A, an alpha herpes virus. B, a beta herpes virus. C, a gamma herpes virus. Or D, a retrovirus. Once again, this is tissue from a horse. What is the most likely cause of this lesion? Okay, time's up. This is a classic lesion. If you follow the Wednesday slide conference, or at least you read the results, we see one of these at least every year in there. Um, it's a great lesion in horse. The lesion is severe fibro multifocal fibrosis, and the condition is called equine multinodular pulmonary fibrosis. And it is caused by C, a gamma herpes virus. This is equine herpes virus type 5, a gamma herpes virus. If we look at the other answers, uh, alpha herpes virus in a horse, well that would be EHV1, causing abortion, stillborn foals, respiratory disease, and occasionally neurologic diseases in horses. Beta herpes virus in horses, cytomegalovirus, 
usually only manifests when the animal is severely immunosuppressed, like used to be seen in Arab foals with combined immunodeficiency. And a retrovirus of a horse, well, uh, equine lentivirus is a retrovirus which causes uh, equine infectious anemia, but this is a gamma herpes virus. Uh, if you want to know more about this, there is a very good article, review article by Kurt Williams uh, in VetPath in 2014. Uh, gamma herpes viruses and pulmonary fibrosis, evidence from humans, horses, and rodents. Okay, moving on to slide number three. This is tissue from an adult horse. Name the most likely cause. A, cantharidin toxicity. B, equine herpes virus type 1. C, equine aphthovirus. And D, halocephalobus gingivalis. Once again, this is tissue from an adult horse. Name the most likely cause from those four choices. Okay, time's up. This one is straight out of Joe Kennedy. The foils don't make any sense. Um, very disparate choices that you have. I told you this was tissue from an adult horse. And if someone's going to give you the information that it's an adult or a foal, you need to readjust your differential diagnosis to fit. So don't try and say there could be a foal disease that pops up in, in adult horses. Go with what you're given. The correct answer to this is A, cantharidin toxicity. Cantharidin toxicity, also known as blister beetle toxicosis, uh, is a disease of progress, as Dr. King used to say. Um, it only happens in uh, hay that is A, infected with blister beetles, and B, that is crimped to help with drying because when you crimp it, you crush it, you crush the blister beetles. And the cantharidin is actually a toxin which helps to prevent predation of the blister beetle eggs. And the female will lay it when she lays eggs on the, uh, on the eggs itself. So any animal that tries to eat them is going to have a lot of problems. Well, when you crush the female, you crush the glands, you release that cantharidin, it contaminates the hay. And this particular toxin causes necrosis in a wide range of organs. The heart is only one of them. The urinary tract is a second one. You can have ulcers in the GI tract. It is a very potent toxin and usually one that uh, uh, affects horses. Uh, your second choice was equine herpes virus type 1. We just talked about that causing uh, necrosis in, multi, multi, nah, in many foals. You can see disseminated areas of necrosis in multiple organs, including the lung, the liver, the spleen, the adrenal glands. It doesn't cause these wide areas of necrosis, as we see right here. And usually it does not do that in horses. A very immunosuppressed horse can have a recrudescent infection that can cause infection, but it's not going to cause a lesion that looks like this. Okay, number three is equine aptovirus. That's foot and mouth disease. We're going to see ulcerations on the coronary band, maybe in the lips. Uh, you could see in very young animals, not usually horses, but uh, uh, in pigs and calves, you will see myocardial necrosis. It's called tiger striping, and there are large areas with accompanying lymphoplasmocytic inflammation, not a disease of an adult horse. And finally, four, Halocephalobus gingivalis. Uh, this is a helminth parasite. This is parthenogenetic, meaning that you'll only find females and uh, larva in the lesions. They don't need uh, male worms for some reason. And this is a parasite that usually comes in through the gingival crevice, and then it often migrates along nerves. You can see it in the brain. You can see large lesions in the mouth. Uh, you can also see it in a number of other areas, including the sheath, the adrenal glands. I'm not familiar with it causing lesions in the heart. I suppose that it could. Um, but they're generally granulomatous lesions rather than these blanching areas of necrosis. So this is a great picture of cantharidin toxicity in a horse. Okay, moving on. Here's a wonderful picture by Dr. Nancy Cock, and this is tissue from a chimpanzee. 
and I would like to know the most likely cause of this lesion. And yes, it's a lesion. This is not the normal way that chimpanzee's mouth looks. Your choices are A, pox virus, B, papillomavirus, C, polyomavirus, or D, herpes virus. Once again, what is the most likely cause of this lesion? Okay, time's up. This one's straight out of uh, Non-Human Primates and Biomedical Research, uh, Volume 2 of a series, and this one was edited by Keith Mansfield's pages 34 through 35. And I think that uh, if you know uh, a number of other species, you could probably figure this one out on your own. Uh, the correct answer was B, papillomavirus. And we're seeing these fleshy papillomas on the lips of the chimpanzee. There's also considerable gingival hyperplasia here, but uh, I'm looking for the cause of, of the uh, papillomatous lesions in the mouth. And you can see papillomas in the mouth of a number of species, including dogs, including cattle, and chimps are, are no different. Your other choices were A, pox virus. A pox virus in a chimp, I'm sure they're probably susceptible to uh, smallpox, they're very close to humans, maybe even some of the uh, agents that cause monkeypox. But uh, that is more of, when we talked about pox many times, that's more proliferative and then central areas of necrosis um, and would look somewhat different than this. Your choice C was a polyoma virus, and uh, actually, uh, there are some polyoma viruses that you can find in chimps. They have to be immunosuppressed like people, um, and they usually manifest in the neurologic system, but uh, you'll probably never, ever encounter something like that. And then finally, D, a herpes virus. Once again, that's an ulcerative thing. Uh, I'm sure that chimps have herpes viruses, as all species do. Most species um, will get stressed and they will get mouth ulcers. Not something that you would think about in chimps so much, but something that you should always be concerned about with Asian macaques. Um, because if it's transmitted to humans, it tends to result in a life-threatening or fatal encephalitis. Okay, papillomavirus, fantastic picture. If we move along, slide number five is tissue from a chicken. What is the cause of this lesion? Your choices are A, avian metanumovirus, B, avian influenza, C, splenomegaly, or D, Newcastle disease. Okay, so question is, name the disease or name the condition in a chicken. Your choices are A, avian metanumovirus, B, avian influenza. C, splenomegaly, or D, Newcastle disease. Okay, time's up. Now, we are looking at the distal esophagus. We are looking at the proventriculus and the entrance to the ventriculus. You can see there's a bit of a fibrin cast within the esophagus. That's never a good thing. And that there is swelling uh, within the proventriculus and multifocal hemorrhage. This is a pretty classic lesion, and there are a lot of pictures out there. When you have the proventricular glands, hemorrhage over the proventricular glands is a very characteristic sign for D, Newcastle disease. If we look at the other foils, and this one is straight out of the Avian Disease Manual, 7th edition, pages 62 through 66. If we look at the foils, A was avian metanumovirus, um, that is a disease that causes rhinitis and sinusitis in adult birds. It causes runting stunting syndrome in young birds, um, but not one that will cause significant GI signs in birds. Uh, B, avian influenza. You certainly get a lot of hemorrhages throughout birds with avian influenza, as well as with Newcastle disease, as well as with pastoral multocida, which I could have thrown in here. 
but it's the hemorrhage over the glands of the proventriculus that's going to key you into this is Newcastle disease. There, those three diseases, Newcastle, HPAI, and Pastorella, you open them up, the bird's full of hemorrhages or whatever. There are some other signs that you want to look for. Uh, hemorrhages, congestions of the shanks in HPAI. Um, but this hemorrhage around the, the glands of the proventriculus, you got to remember that one. Uh, splenomegaly. Splenomegaly is the chicken version of uh, marble spleen disease, which pheasants get, of uh, hemorrhagic enteritis, which turkeys get, and usually this is seen with necrosis and hemorrhage in the duodenum. So that's a little lower down. And obviously those birds are going to get splenomegaly. So avian disease manual, make sure that you go through that as part of your study plan. Slide number six is a classic. This is tissue from a mouse. The question is, the mouse strain that is most resistant to this disease is A, Balb C, B, CBA, C, CD1, or D, B6. Once again, the mouse strain that's most resistant to this disease is A, Balb C, B, CBAs, C, CD1s, or D, B6. This question straight out of Percy and Barthold, and this the answer can be found on page 22. But don't look it up. I'll tell you in just a minute. Okay, back to this one. First, we have to figure out what the disease is. This animal is missing a leg. This animal is missing the end of his tail, and it has several constrictions here. This is classic for ectromelia virus or mouse pox. The condition causes dry gangrene of the extremities and mouse that survive. But remember, like most pox viruses, you have lesions all through these animals. So you have lesions in the lung, lesions in the kidney, and it's a real bear. You have to depopulate these animals. And this is one you never, ever, ever want to see. If the animal survives, you may see splenic scars, which is sort of a weird thing. Um, but you don't want these animals to survive. You want them gone. Uh, oftentimes, this uh, disease has an outbreak because of contaminated serum or some sort of uh, xenobiotic with somebody that was not careful with their culturing. Okay, uh, straight out Percy and Bartle. I generally remember this is that white mice die, black mice don't. So B6, number D would be the correct answer. The other three strains are white, and they usually die. Okay, slide number seven. This one comes from veterinary pathology. So if you're studying for the ACVP exam, you know, better know that pretty well. We usually go back about five years here. We don't read every particular article, um, but we cover it pretty well because that is the magazine of the club that you are wanting to join. It's also the magazine now, the ECVP and the, the JCVP, so it's got to be on everybody's reading list. Um, this is tissue from a white-tailed deer, and this is all straight out of an article from 2015, so you got to know this one. The tissues from a white-tailed deer, what's the cause of this lesion? A, viral infection of the horn bud. B, a mutation in P53. C, a disruption in testosterone production, or D, trauma. What is the cause of this lesion? Okay, time's up. This article was written by Dr. Monk, I believe Dr. Kevin Keel, a friend of mine and who lectures for the Foundation on Wildlife Disease from time to time, wrote this particular article. Um, it is a single case report, but this has been reported a number of times. It's a well-known problem in both free-ranging and commercial farmed deer. And the correct answer is C, a disruption in testosterone production. This is an endocrine problem. 
Uh, the, the other three foils I just sort of made up. Viral infection of the hornbud? Eh, I don't know. I've never seen that. I have seen uh, tumors of the horns. Melanoma, certainly for one. Uh, mutation in P53. Well, that's cancer. Um, and D, trauma. I suppose if you traumatize, remember, there are two horn buds. So you'd have to traumatize both of them and really make a mess of them, I suppose. But uh, this is an endocrine problem, and it's an imbalance in testosterone production. Let's move on. I like this test. It has all sorts of different species. We've had exotics and wildlife and laboratory animals. And here we have a guinea pig. I suppose I could just ask you what the species was and didn't tell you. You have to figure out what you're looking at. But uh, this is tissue from a guinea pig, and I want you to name the most likely cause. Your choices are A, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, B, Streptococcus equi variant zoepidemicus, also known as Strepzo. C, Streptococcus pneumoniae, or D, Portatella bronchoseptica. Once again, name the most likely cause. Okay, time's up. Now, if you want a reference for this, go back to Percy and Bartold, pages 228 to 230. Um, all of these agents that I mentioned are pathogens of guinea pigs. Now, when you look at this guinea pig, the first thing I want you to notice is the amount of fibrin. Whenever you see massive amounts of fibrin in any species, I want you to think just for a moment, could it be Streptococcus? Streptococcus has some, some exotoxins that act very much like endotoxin. They whack the endothelium, and you often with streptococcus will get tremendous amounts of fibrin, especially in the potential spaces like the peritoneum, the pleura, the joints, and the meninges. So I want you to think, it doesn't matter what species. If this was a pig and you saw that fibrin, hey, I'm going to think about Glasser's disease and strep is a major cause. Um, there's lots of things that, lots of pathogenic strep out there. One thing that the pathogenic ones share is their ability to cause massive fibrin deposition. So I'm thinking fibrin when I go in here. Okay, the correct answer. If you know the diseases of the guinea pig is going to be streptococcus pneumoniae. It's an absolutely classic disease. It's more historical um, than we see now, but you can still see it because people harbor strep pneumonia in our respiratory system. When we get stressed in the wintertime, we start to shed it. And so it can cause a real problem with in laboratory animal colonies um, for guinea pigs, for non-human primates, for rats. So you got to be careful about that. Streptococcus pneumoniae, um, if we probably, if we poked around the chest, we'd see a lot in there. If we hit the meninges or the joints, we'd see fibrin in there. Classic widespread septicemia causing fibrin deposition in multiple organs. Let's go back to the other ones. A, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis affects rodents of all types. Um, is spread by rodent urine, rodent feces, and but that usually is also a sepsis, but it causes necrosis. Starts usually uh, attacking the white uh, not the white matter, but the lymphoid tissue of the ileum, the spleen, and the mesenteric lymph nodes. It's a hot gram negative, so that's the normal plan of attack. Eventually, it'll erode through the wall of the uh, ileum and get into the portal circulation, whereupon it'll shoot up to the liver. And the thing about Yersinia is that in these areas of necrosis in these four organs, you're going to see large colonies of bacilli, and you're going to see little white dots in these organs, not this outpouring of fibrin. Uh, strep B was a really good foil because I asked you about Streptococcus equi variant zooepidemicus. Strep zo in guinea pigs causes abscissation of the submandibular lymph node. It's the guinea pig equivalent of strangles in the horse, and it affects the mandibular lymph nodes, causes them to swell greatly, and the disease is called lumps. The correct name is cervical lymphadenitis, which is a nice descriptive name. Um, but so the classic disease, the Lansfield Group C strep of cervical lymphadenitis is strep zo. 
And then D, Bordetella bronchoseptica is a bad actor in, uh, in the guinea pig and causes uh, a fibrinosuppurative and necrotizing bronchopneumonia, very similar to what we saw in the first question about Bordetella bronchoseptica. Guinea pigs are extremely susceptible to it. If you go out uh, at, at Easter time and you go to the pet store, and a lot of pet stores will put pet rabbits and guinea pigs in the front window because they're impulse buys around Easter time. Uh, if you go and do that by the rabbit, the rabbit tolerates Bordetella bronchoseptica and it carries it in its upper respiratory system, all those guinea pigs are going to be dead in about three weeks. It is a very potent pathogen, causes a histologic lesion in uh, guinea pigs that looks like shipping fever with oat cells and just the ugliest pneumonia you'd want to see, but it does not cause this fibrin accumulation in the abdomen. Very little going on in the abdomen of those animals at all. Okay, probably a lot more than you want to know about guinea pigs, but that covers a lot of important diseases. Okay, we only have two more slides left. So I want you to put on your thinking caps. I want to end this on a high note. And this is tissue from a German Shepherd dog. What is the cause of this lesion? Your choices are A, incomplete development or hypoplasia. B, blockage of the pancreatic duct. C, autoimmunity. Or D, zinc deficiency. This is tissue from a German Shepherd dog. What is the cause of this lesion? Okay, time's up. Here's a great lesion. I hope that you didn't let sort of the redness of this remnant tissue of the pancreas uh, throw you off. We're looking at stroma, we're looking at islets, but the bulk of the pancreas is largely missing. Most of the acinar tissue is gone. This animal probably has voluminous stools, which are foul smelling. It is not digesting uh, protein or fat. It's not gonna make a very good indoor dog. And this is not an uncommon lesion in German Shepherds. They have a breed predisposition. So do rough coated collies. And this is pancreatic atrophy. For many years, the condition, because it starts so early in the affected breeds, and there are many different affected breeds. A lot of work has been done in Europe on the Hove of Art breed, which gets this. And this, uh, the cause is C, autoimmunity. The animals start directing uh, the immune system as early as two to four months. And interestingly enough, in this particular condition, as opposed to a lot of the other idiopathic uh, autoimmune conditions like we would see in the thyroid, there is no fibrosis here. The tissue just sort of goes away. And what we're looking at is stroma and the islets, which are largely not affected, but the acinar tissue is gone. The, your choices were A, incomplete development or hypoplasia. That was a, that was a very uh, uh, heated argument for many, many years. Um, but the problem is that uh, uh, because it starts so early in life, the lesions are quite advanced. A lot of people assume that that was hypoplastic. Um, I think it's been very well settled. Uh, in Jubb and Kennedy, volume two, page 362, which is a reference for this, um, it is now pretty well established that this is an autoimmune disease. The pancreas is formed properly and it undergoes atrophy as well as inflammation and subsequent atrophy over time. B, blockage of the pancreatic duct. That certainly would cause some problems. It would probably cause an acute pancreatitis in the dog, but that does not explain the loss of tissue here. You would expect a hemorrhagic uh, and necrotizing pancreatitis with areas of fat necrosis. Uh, if you're looking at pancreatitis in the dog, you don't see fat necrosis, you may not be looking at pancreatitis. I will leave it at that. And finally, zinc deficiency D. Zinc is a potent toxin for the acinar tissue of the pancreas in many species. Once again, uh, probably would not, you would see a necrotizing lesion would not result in this marked loss of tissue. Okay, we only have one more for today's test, and this is 
Slide number 10. This is tissue from a cat. And name the most likely outcome. Okay, you have four choices. Now, as pathologists, you know, we don't have to treat the animals, but we should be able to diagnose their diseases and tell what a likely outcome is going to be. So, tissue from a cat, name the most likely outcome. A, visceral metastasis, comma, often to the liver. Visceral metastasis, often to the liver. B, nothing. This cat's eye just looks weird. C, glaucoma, or D, metastasis to the local lymph node. Once again, tissue from a cat, name the most likely outcome. Okay, time's up. Correct answer is C, glaucoma. We are looking at an irritable, I-R-I-D-I-D-A-L, an irritable melanoma, which is the most common type of melanoma in the cats, in and around the cat's eye. It generally starts as a patch of pigmentation, then eventually will spread, resulting in thickening of the iris. And you can imagine if the iris is thickened all the way around as this one would be, then you're going to impinge on the filtration angle, and many of these cats eventually will develop glaucoma, which uh, will result in the enucleation of the eye. Uh, this uh, ophthalmologist was obviously very ambitious and figured, I'll just take both of them out while I'm in the neighborhood. I'm hoping that's not the case. Um, your other choices were A, visceral metastasis, often to the liver. That does happen. And we've had some great cases in the Wednesday slide conference over the years um, of these. And it's just amazing what the liver looks like. But it's not from the irritable melanomas. It's generally from the scleral melanomas. But those are bad actors and tend to metastasize. They can also go to local lymph nodes. That was D. But they're very uncommon. Um, they're, um, they're occasionally seen. They occasionally metastasize, but when you think about them in terms of comparing them to the numbers of animals for, with glaucoma, it's not even close. It's pretty rare, but a very striking occurrence. And B, nothing. The cat's eye just looks weird. Well, uh, it does look weird, but uh, uh, chances are, I bet you a dollar to a donut, this cat will eventually develop glaucoma. If you want to read more about that, look in Job and Kennedy, Volume 1, pages 483 and 484, and talk to you all about aerial uh, melanomas in cats. Well, that brings us to the end of this uh, Gross Path Challenge. I hope uh, that you did fantastically. I hope you learned something along the way. And I invite you to come back for other Gross Path Challenges. If this is number uh, 42, we must have 41 others available to you on the uh, Foundation's YouTube channel or the JPC's video library. Uh, until next Friday, have a great week, and I hope you enjoy wonderful health.